Well, you're coming here and you're seeing this title of uh, CRP for wildlife and whitetails. And, uh, and, and I think a lot of people enroll their farms and farmland into CRP. And it's kind of a dual purpose. Um, for one, you want to get that income back. It's a um, crop reserve program by the federal government. So you put this cropland, you set it aside, you're setting it aside for a specific number of years. And for that, you get money back. And because farmland, the rents have been so high and uh, crop prices have been high over the last decade anyways, then um, it's always a huge roller coaster. It's, it's a game, you know, farmers play that sometimes it's not worth it to plant almost. Sometimes it is, it depends on the size farm. But it's a tough life and so this is a way to get money back per acre maybe you're getting out of farming bottom line is you want to slant towards wildlife and, I, and so a lot of people look at it you know they have that focus of wildlife and oh by the way i get this per acre back and and I, sometimes they're talked into that the crp program that they're signing up for is going to be great for wildlife when a large percentage of the time sorry to bring this to you but it's not and so I want to talk about how you can try to slant it. And a lot of these plan writers are pretty flexible. And I think they're finding they need to be because there's more education, more teaching out there to let people know that if they put this, not only are people setting aside land for ag, agricultural production uh, for the next 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, whatever that time period is, but they're also setting aside for wildlife, meaning there's not going to be a lot of wildlife there for the next 10, 15, 20 years. And you have to think of it that way. So... There's things you can do with your CRP program and planting open fields in general um, that'll make sure that you have a good amount of wildlife and a good focus on that piece of property that you're considering doing this. And we're going to talk about number one, what's a monoculture? Monoculture, to me, you know, people will say, for example, if you plant a field in straight switchgrass, some will say that's a monoculture because there's only one grass. But if someone plants it in five grasses, let's say there's big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, switchgrass, whatever you want, combination you want to put in there, that that's somehow not a monoculture. Folks, it's still grass. Grass is grass. If it's all conifer, doesn't matter if it's red pine, white pine, jack pine, scotch pine, it's all pine still somewhat acts the same and does the same things to the soil. It's the same amount of ground coverage and vegetative coverage, and it's the same value, whether low or high, to wildlife. So some of the CRP plantings, they might have various grasses, forbs, forages in them, but bottom line is it's planted as a monoculture over the entire 40 acre piece or 10 acres or five acres, whatever you're enrolling into the program. Folks, that's a monoculture. When it's all the same, it's a monoculture. Think about the height of your planting and the height of anything. And the height of the overall overstory of your planting or the type of habitat you're looking at will really give you a bearing and an indication of the value for wildlife. For example, when you have all grasses, forbs, forages, weeds, they're all a similar height. Let's say that height is four feet or three feet. When you have shrubs, let's say they're all at that eight or 10 feet. Then let's say you have conifers are a little bit higher, hardwoods a little bit higher than that. They're all different levels. That's why a hardwood, stand of hardwoods, is a monoculture. It doesn't matter what kind of hardwoods are in there. It's a monoculture of hardwoods, conifers. It's all the same height. But when you mix those four components of hardwood regeneration, conifers, shrubs, grasses, forbs, forages, briars, all together in the same spot, that is true diversity. Not putting different briars in a patch, that's not diversity. Different conifers in a patch, different shrubs in a patch of shrubs, still shrubs. I hope that makes sense. We need to look outside a, into a larger box a lot of times where by definition, someone might say that five grasses is not a monoculture when it is because it's all grass. And that's the problem with a lot of CRP programs. You're planting and doing something over a large landscape that's all the same. And when it's all the same, there's little value for wildlife. Best practice is something that creates multi-levels. And it could be that um, it's shrubs, grasses, briars, and maybe some pockets of some hardwood regeneration thrown in. At least you're starting to promote multi-level canopy cover, and that'll give you diversity. But at the same time, you're producing edge. So when you have pockets of, you take an area, and let's say you have an area of shrubs, you have an area of conifers, you have an area of hardwood regeneration mixed in, Forbs, forages, grasses all around, that creates edge. 
because there's that edge around each one of those changes in habitat. That's why whitetails are creatures of edge. So typically when you put a bullseye on the map and you hit whitetail in the middle, it encompasses a lot of wildlife because whitetails are creatures of edge, meaning they're creatures of diversity and habitat, not monoculture. You find monocultures, doesn't matter what it is, you don't find a lot of whitetails. A big open switchgrass field, I love planting switchgrass. But if you have a 10 acre field of switchgrass, you don't have a, a lot of whitetails in there unless there's a lack of cover in the area, say in Northern Ohio. And you see by the third day of gun season in an area where you have 10 acres of switchgrass in northern Ohio where it's the biggest patch of cover within two miles in any direction you might have a lot of deer in there by the third day of gun season but they're not there by choice they're there by necessity because they don't have cover and they know if they go in that switchgrass field you're gonna have to bump them out to get them out during the daylight so that's the difference we're, we're trying to produce things that wildlife want and they desire not that they're forced to use, especially forced to use by some type of program. Deer, creatures, wildlife, they have to have cover. That's the limiting factor in most CRP plantings. If it's laying on the ground in December and January with wet snow, like right now, even right now we have switchgrass out here. I love switchgrass. We have two year old switchgrass even. It's forming caves the size of this table. This table's four by six, four by five right around there. Three and a half by five, let's say that. You see rabbit tracks going in there. Pheasants can go in there, they can find a cover, and then they can escape to the next pocket, to the next pocket. So even when we have heavy, heavy wet snow like we've had and then freezing rain, we had a quarter inch freezing rain the other day, there's still pockets of cover, but most CRP plantings right now are flat. They're completely flat. They can barely hold a mouse in there. Barely hold a mouse, meaning when that mouse gets out, gets above that crust of snow and is on the snow, they're, they're sitting ducks for any birds of prey. And that's where pheasants, rabbits, that's where they fall victim to largely is those predators from above. And so they don't have that canopy of cover over them in the form of grasses, briars, thick brush cover, bushes. Then they get picked off. And so you have to have cover that's a limiting factor. So if your CRP and most CRP plantings are, are down to the dirt. And they might even say, well, we have 1.5 uh, pounds of switchgrass per acre. Folks, that's not enough. That switchgrass is diluted. You have to have pockets of solid switchgrass grass at five to six pounds plus per acre. I recommend eight to 10. You don't want more than that because it becomes matted. The wind can push it down. So that's the problem with a lot of these CRP mixes is there's no cover. And so when there's no cover and you get into the limiting time of the year, that's why down the road they planted thousands of pheasants and there's none there because there's no cover because the cover is smashed down right now and there's nothing left for them. There's no place for a pheasant to go, so they get picked off very easily by predators. So that's what you really need. You have to have cover. So what I find the best way to take over an old field is when you actually look at mother nature say upland cover. As an example, that's our early successional growth with pockets of shrub, pockets of briars, pockets of hardwood regeneration, scattered conifers here and there. That's the best form of old field growth cover. I don't like when someone says, well, this goldenrod, goldenrod has a value for this. It has a food value of this, and it's cover. Folks, it's just goldenrod, and it's not really that great a winter cover either. I mean, all these pieces alone have great attributes and positives but by themselves they're all a negative i hope that makes sense you have to have diversity so i like seeing pockets of cover with brows let's face it we're talking mostly cover and brows we're not talking good food quality and that's what is misleading sometimes too someone will say well this crp planting is great brows so we're going to have lots of wildlife in there not true if there's not cover and this isn't a food plot so on private land you can't attract crp deer to crp on a daily basis without some type of supporting cover if the nearest ag field if the nearest food plot if the nearest major food source is a mile away or more half mile away or more why do deer actually go to the crp field unless there's very limiting cover and high hunting pressure which is not a good thing either and the crp actually has to have some cover when it's laying flat on the ground with the wet snow in november those deer aren't going to be there anyways, let alone any other creature. So I like patchworks of, of cover where you have, actually you could even take a 10 acre field, surround it in switch grass 20, 30 feet wide, 15 feet wide, whatever it might be, and then put patches in there that are quarter acre, half acre in size. Let the rest grow to early successional growth. That's going to be really good because then now you have solid switch grass that makes sure that briars and weeds aren't coming into that area. It also makes sure that hardwood regeneration shrubs are not coming into those pockets. But then you allow those areas to grow on the outside of that. So now you still get sun into the area because you're still keeping those solid pockets of switch grass. And then you have that early successional growth growing around whatever rootstock seeds are in the soil it grows. 
You might even have bad noxious weeds to begin with, but you can spot spray those if you want. But over time, that's called early successional growth for a reason because it's early growth. It eventually is taken over by older growth and it eventually is replaced by timber, wood, shrubs. You can see that succession as, it, as the habitat in that area ages within the habitat structure. So I like looking at a patchwork. That's very critical. So best CRP? Well, again, it goes back to monoculture. It's hard to say that CRP is very good for wildlife in general at all, but there's a lot of plan writers out there that are becoming a lot more flexible to say this solid patch of switchgrass over here, this solid patch of switchgrass over here, this area of, um, this area of broadleaf pollinators, this area of grasses mixed in, this area of early successional growth. You can still mow it all, but you still have that founding cover aspect of switchgrass that's going to be there. And let's make no mistake, deer don't like to necessarily bed in switchgrass because there's no food value. So they have to actually leave two to three times during the day because they feed five times in a 24 hour period. So when they're in that cover, they have to actually leave that cover to go feed. And deer would prefer that they have some type of browse value within their bedding area. Uh, hardwood regeneration, briars, pollinator blends, woody rootstock, woody growth that's coming in, regeneration of hardwood. So that's that best CRP. If you can get someone to slant that, but really, I want you to go in this to this with your eyes wide open. And speaking of eyes, you can see I have my glasses on. With diabetes, I have a little swelling in my left eye, so they give me a needle injection once a month. So that was yesterday. Can't wear contacts for two days. Uh, now it was five days the first time, but there is improvement, so that's a good thing. But uh, not going blind anytime soon that I, I'll knock on wood, I hope so. But anyways, uh, all looking good. Diabetes is doing well too. But, um, you know, really, I want you to go into this with your eyes wide open so that you can say, you know, really look at, if it was my money and my land, I'd prefer to have a smaller parcel and, uh, and do whatever I want with that cover because the wildlife and whitetail value is going to be several times greater than enrolling it in CRP. That's just a fact. It's just the way it goes. Unfortunately, I'm sorry to say that. But uh, there's a lot of people out there that say you're, you've had this farmland, you've rented it for a long time. You might want to pull it out of ag production. Maybe you're getting out of farming and you want to enroll. In, and this is a way to pay the taxes. This is the way you inherited the land. This is a way to pay taxes. Maybe you bit off more than you can choose, chew and you you know, bought a big whitetail parcel and you have to rent it out or you have to get CRP to pay the bills. I'd prefer you sell portions of it um, if you want to look at that as an investment, find a better investment for your money than just sending CRP land aside. Um, but bottom line is there's people that have to make those choices. We have to put this in CRP. Just make sure you go in with your eyes wide open, see if there's flexibility to provide solid cover pockets. You actually have cover within there and you made it this long. You're probably interested in everything we do. And one of the things uh, I really want to mention is Camp Kicking Bear. We're a huge supporter of. They have calendars this year. Uh, you can go to kickingbear.org and find that. That's actually Jen helping out in our annual charity event we have. We've given over 50000 to Kicking Bear as a WHS company because of the great people that attend the event. We've been able to funnel all that money, every dime, um, to Camp Kicking Bear uh, within our charity events. But Camp Kicking Bear is a huge organization. They put on events all around the country, even up into Alaska, down into Mexico. They do a lot of things for the youth. Um, lots of different at-risk kids, kids from inner city, kids that aren't at risk, but they just wanna make sure they maintain their position and actually participating in the outdoors. And so it's a great organization. You can buy these calendars at kickingbear.org. There's ways that you can actually donate. There's a code on the back of the calendar that you can enter. And so once a month they have uh, drawings um, that are associated with this calendar and, and there's a lot of great sponsors. We have this year with our seed company, we'll be donating 1% of all gross proceeds. They go to Camp Kicking Bear. So that's gross before we take anything off the top. It's not our net or anything like that. And so we're, we're not only do we have the charity event, we support Ray Howell, the founder in Camp Kicking Bear wholly, but we uh, put our money where our mouth is and we really want to support them. Our goal is to give in our charity event. Charity event this year is on Father's Day and uh, it was two years ago. We had some scheduling conflict, but this year and I hope every year going forward it will be on Father's Day. Um, so we have a great turnout for that. It's limited to 50 people that want to come check out the habitat and hunting strategy we have set up here. Bring your kids. We highly encourage that. We provide lunch. We'll have information coming about that in the future. And then that, along with that, we have our hunt drawing where we have 100 uh, people that pay $100. We give that entire chunk of money to Camp Kicking Bear. And then we have a lucky person like Tyler this year that comes out and hunt with us. And he, he shot a nice buck this year. So we have a lot of fun. They just stay with us for the weekend. 
and have a good time. So I urge you to check that out. It's a great organization. Um, we look forward to donating to that and being a part of it. Um, to me, it's it, what I like to do and for what's important to me to give back to the youth and get youth in the outdoors and help their families out. Uh, it's really important to us. I hope it's important to you. I hope you enjoyed the CRP talk right here. We get off on a tangent sometimes, but really it's just all about trying to help you and open up your eyes because every administrator is going to see that CRP is great. You know, everything, um, it's no different than if there's forestry practices that are slanted more towards boards per foot. Uh, forester for that practice is going to say it's great for wildlife and it's not necessarily so. And a lot of times they don't know any better. That's just what they've been taught. There's some great foresters out there. There's some great plant administrators, but by and large, really go into your eyes wide open when getting to CRP. Understand what actually attracts wildlife, which is why we have this channel. If you want to check out Best Whitetail and Wildlife Habitat in our playlist, we have dozens of videos for you to check out there. And uh, really go into not only CRP, but whether it's food plots, trail camera use, nocturnal box, hunting strategies, the rut, everything, you can follow on this channel to go into 2023 with your eyes wide open with a goal of having a great hunt and experience great whitetails and wildlife habitat this fall. Hey, I'm really excited to introduce to you our Hills and Thermals web class. It's something we worked on all year. We're trying to put lots of facets of scouting, aerial imagery, diagrams on the whiteboard to really teach you how the wind moves through hills and how you should find bedding areas, how it relates to deer movements in general, how that relates to this is a bedding area stand, this is a food source afternoon stand. We really tried to put this together and offer you a complete picture of how to navigate hills and find better success consistently where you hunt.